Hello, today we are visiting one of the most historic aircraft carrier museums in the world, the USS Hornet Sea, Air and Space Museum located right here in Alameda, California. Join us as we step aboard this legendary ship, which played a crucial role in World War II, served in the Vietnam War and was instrumental in the recovery of the first astronaut from the moon. The ship is moored at what's known as Jimmy Doolittle Pier. On April 1, 1942, 16 B-25 bombers were housed aboard the original USS Hornet, the CV-8, to strike the heart of Japan. This operation marked the first American attack on the Japanese soil during World War II. The USS Hornet, CV-12, which we are on today, was named in honor to the original Hornet, carrying on its legacy. To get aboard, you have to climb these stairs. The ship built in 1943 at the Newport News Shipbuilding Dry and Dock Company. The USS Hornet Museum spans multiple decks, offering visitors a chance to explore everything from the flight deck to the hangar deck and even parts of the lower levels. This is a munition elevator. The USS Hornet CV-12 has an incredible combat record. This ship took part in numerous Pacific campaigns, contributing to the liberation of the Philippines and even delivering critical hits to the mongly Japanese battleship Yamato with four torpedoes and three bombs. Let's take a look at planes. This is a Grumman FM-2 Wildcat, a little fighter that was a workhorse during the early years of the war. And just near we can see Grumman TBM Avenger. This torpedo bomber was known for its durability and was flown by no one other than future President George H. W. Bush during World War II. This is one of the ship's original aircraft elevators, used to lift planes from the hangar deck up to the fly deck. Imagine this whole platform moving with the weight of the entire aircraft on it. We are moving forward to anchor room. Navigating the narrow corridors of the ship really gives you a feel for what life was like aboard. Space was at premium and every inch had to be used efficiently. Check out this sheer sight of anchor chain. The mechanism could lift or drop the massive anchors, allowing the Hornet to stay steady even in the rough water.
Time to check out some of the amazing aircraft on display, each with its own story and role in naval aviation history. We are moving to hangar deck. This is FAU-1 Crusader, one of the first supersonic jets in the US service. Nicknamed the last of the gunfighters, it was known for its speed and agility. Here's the radar system of the Crusader, the marvel of its time, capable of tracking targets at supersonic speeds. This is an authentic fly suit from the 60s and 70s, a period of rapid advancement in aviation technology. This seat equipped with an injection mechanism could save a pilot's life in an emergency situation. The Douglas TA-4J Skyhawk, a light attack jet, saw extensive use at the trainer A crowd. This one made its last flight in 2003. This is a gift shop. This is Grumman S2E Tracker, an anti-submarine warfare ASW aircraft designed to hunt and track enemy submarines during the Cold War. It was the first aircraft to combine radar, sonar, and weapons uh, in a single package, making it available as set in naval operations. Next we have the FJ-2 Fury, a swept wing jet fighter developed in the early 50s. The Fury was known for its powerful performance and was one of the first jets used by the US Marine Corps. This Fury is equipped with four 20mm cannons, providing immersed firepower during dogfights. Looks like there is a spot for a quick snack. This is a Gemini capsule boilerplate used during the Gemini space program. These capsules were test versions used for practicing recovering operations and evaluating splashdown conditions. One of the most famous roles of the USS Hornet played was the part of the recovery of the Apollo 11 astronauts. After the astronaut Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins made history by landing on the moon, they were brought back to the Earth by this very ship. These are first footprints made by Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins upon returning to Earth after the moon landing. Here is a historical photos. After being brought aboard the USS Hornet, the astronauts were immediately transferred to this mobile quarantine facility, which was actually made from air steam camper. This is where they spent a few days back to on Earth, isolating until they were cleared by NASA doctors. President Richard Nixon speaking with astronauts. Here's a closer look at the mud suit used by astronauts. Mm -hmm. 
And this is an actual helicopter used to retrieve the Apollo 11 astronaut from the Pacific Ocean. This same helicopter also appeared in the 1995 Mula Apollo 13 and took part in the mission for Apollo 8, 10, 11, 12 and 13. It's a true icon of the space race era. We are now heading down to the second deck where we will explore more of the ship's living quarters and special exhibition. Ship's Chapel. Moving through the ship's corridors, we arrive at an exhibit dedicated to the contributions of African Americans in the military. These are crew sleeping quarters. It's a tight space, but this was home for hundreds of sailors. See those yellow and red metal structures. These trucks were used for move heavy ammunition like torpedoes. We arrived to Torpedo Workshop. The USS Hornet V-12 primary served an aircraft carrier designed to launch and recover various types of naval aircraft. As an Essex-class carrier, its main offensive and defensive weapon were its aircraft, which were armed with bombs, rockets and torpedoes, depending on the mission type. Here the date look at torpedoes aboard the USS Hornet. This section highlights the contribution of women in the military. This is a ship's laundry room.
Here's the sick bay where the injured or ill crew members were treated. The medical staff had to be prepared for anything from minor injuries to major surgeries. An X-ray room aboard the ship. This exhibit about legendary Gdolito Raid. The B-25 mature bombers were specially modified for this daring mission which struck at Heritage Japan in 1942. Here is an original newspaper announcing the success of Doolittle Raid. All throughout the all throughout the ship. Mm -hmm. um, another sort of thing I, I point out because we're going to talk obviously a little bit about in the engine room uh, about power 
production, the, the generators on that. Uh, but you also have these funny looking things. Uh, everybody asks what they're, what they're for, uh, A, B, and C. So you have a three phase system, but they're color coded. So think big extension cord for battle damage, whatever. You have the cords and on those cords that you see on the, on the bulkhead, they're color coded as well. Uh, but there's also these numbers with little, so that even in the dark, you can feel, okay, I got a two, I got a two bump on the, on the cord. Now I plug it in. And then these things are the wrenches to actually screw it in to hold that. So if you have to run, you know, electric pumps or something like that um, to take care of, you know, some emergency situation, you can do that. And you'll see those in the casualty power system all throughout the ship. Uh, same idea, another one of these uh, to be able to flood uh, different void spaces. Uh, so you have spaces that, a void space is a space that doesn't normally, it's not a proper tank, it's an empty space, it's an empty room. Mm -hmm. Can be used as a tank if needed. Often you're keeping a void space for reserve buoyancy because you want to have enough so that if you do take battle damage on, you have enough empty air space to, to keep you afloat. Well, if for some reason you need to either counteract, you've taken damage on this ship, this side of the ship, you're starting to list, you need to counter. Yeah. Well, you so you have a good, um, the catapult uh, pieces of our plan, they get a good one on this side. <laughs> we have sort of you set your own pace. <laughs> Have you been up to the flight deck yet? I guess. Okay. So you saw the, the catapults up on the flight deck, right? Yes. Where the planes are? On many ships, certainly modern ships, there's steam catapults. On this ship, they were hydraulic catapults. Uh, so this is where the catapult machinery room uh, was. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd have... I love sailor humor. No, it's not actually alcohol. Uh, that's sailor's wishful thinking. Um, but tanks that would be filled with, with high pressure air, and then one that would be filled with hydraulics. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, you fire that air is pushing the hydraulics. Now you've got this piston moving, and it's moving the, the catapult up on the flight deck. Following this was steam, the Nimitz class, there's still steam, albeit coming from nuclear reactors. It's how it works. Uh, right? Yeah, it gives you an idea of how this would function. So, you know, this stuff is that, the tanks are these guys, and then right there is, is the one, the, the beer one. So, as these pulleys move, it's bringing that, bringing that aircraft up. So the distance on this is about 200 feet, uh, but down here, by the time you work all those pulleys through, obviously you're in a much shorter distance. What I tend to point out are these, you've seen these all through the ship. Do you know what these, what purpose you've seen X's and Y's and Z's? So they tell you when to open a door and when not to open the door. So the Z's, these doors all have to be closed at battle stations. If you see X's, typically they're closed all the time. Y's are closed uh, at, usually at sea, certainly at sea in wartime conditions. So keeping track of that sort of thing tells you, okay, because you want to keep the ship as watertight as possible. And so, yeah, if for some reason, you know, one of these guys needs to get out, they have to get on the phone, get permission to do that. Okay, yes, you have permission to open the door.
this is another elevator? Yeah, it's another part of that elevator. Down there is the Bregan print shop. That's that's a different tour. Um, doesn't directly relate. Below this is where that special weapons comes up, where the nuclear weapons come up. That's what this red line is for. So the Marines are here guarding, and you have the two red lines. So you're not, unless you're one of the cooks who belongs in there. That's the the, the galley for the for the officers' wardroom right above it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a dumb way to bring food up. Unless you're one of those guys, you aren't going in here um, because you know you need special security clearance, obviously, mm -hmm. for where those nuclear weapons were kept. So the Marines are right there to keep that all guarded. They're working on building up that display, so that's what this stuff in the passageway. Is. I have asked John about why do ship museums smell the same? On a, on a couple other ships in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts uh, before I, had years, uh, years later, moved out to California and then started here. Uh, yeah, it's one of those discussions, uh, one of the, there is a video, the curator at USS New Jersey has a video out on what's that smell, it's on YouTube. Uh, his video is informative to your point. He doesn't really come up with a good answer or a good reason why. I can't either, admittedly. Some of that is fuel oil, because uh, you're just never going to get the fuel oil smell out of it. Um, but what else it could it, it, it plays into that? You got me. Um, but yeah, I don't even notice it, um, mm -hmm. because I've been around it for so long, I don't even pay attention. The only time I notice it is if for some reason, to do it intentionally would be strange, uh, but like I take my jacket out of the closet, and if for some reason I were to be home and smell my jet, now I'll notice it. But here, I don't notice it just because I'm around it so often. But yeah, you're not the first person who has said that. So in here, uh, you know, as you look at uh, Gita, um, it's your junk food, as, you, as it were. Uh, so yes, you'd get uh, your regular meals every day, of course. But who doesn't want an occasional junk food? Who doesn't want occasional egg or ice cream or whatever? Uh, and so this would be some place uh, that the sailors could go to do that. The benefit was being on a big ship, battleship, a carrier. Yeah, so that you'd be able to mix it. These are your firefighting uh, apparatus. They go on the front. Navy now uses more of the civilian sort of setup of the Scott Air Packs. Uh, but in this era, they were on the front, and what I love about it, talk about low tech. So you've got this thing, that's how much, you, how you know, basically an egg tank. You set it for so many minutes and you know how much air you got by this. Uh, obviously they're somewhat faulty in that, in that you're not gonna hear that uh, in the midst of a fire and all that kind of chaos. Uh, one of those canisters would go in here, uh, and you, you pull on it open to get the thing going, it starts a chemical reaction, and it gives you an your Obviously the challenge of something like that too is that you're, you're fighting the fire with this thing in front of you. There's something to be said for fighting a fire with it on your back, because if you're on the you know, crouch down with the hose and things in front, you've got this other thing in front of you rather than having the tank on the back, which gets it out of the way when you're kind of... Well, just to kind of give you a sense of the tanks on the ship. So you have over 2 million gallons of fuel. Lots of fuel. The one thing these ships were not is fuel efficient. Um, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you, you know, how many miles a gallon. It's going to depend on speed. But you could, within a few days, dry out those tanks if you were going 32, you know, 32, 33 knots at full speed. And you could dry those tanks out fairly quickly. Now you're generally not going to run at full speed that kind of time. But, yeah, you have all of those tanks. And that's where it gets to what I was talking about about Vs versus Fs. So the Fs are fuel. 
these are the voids, W or water. Um, and then these G's are the gasoline. And you notice where they put the gasoline. Basically middle, in the bow and the stern. What that does is, by putting it in the middle, what'd you do? You just made it in the safer part of the ship, of the fire rooms and engine rooms. We are now with the most critical part of the ship, the engine room. The USS Hortent was originally fitted with four steam turbines driven by eight boilers, producing a total of 150,000 shot horsepower. This is one of the turbines. Using this window, the operator can check which way the screw is turns. In case of fire, the crew can use this long ladder to escape from engine room. We had a couple open on, on the Massachusetts. Uh, with a light bulb in it to show people how far down it goes. Uh, and once or twice I had to climb up and change the light bulb. In the museum you get the ability to look inside the boiler. This is kind of carburetor for the ship. Using this mechanism the operator can measure how many fuel go inside the boiler. We have returned to hangar deck again and later we go back to second deck to check the officer's wardroom.
This is an officer's wardroom. Here officers would gather for meals, briefing and occasionally a moment of relaxation. The wardroom was also a place for discussion the decisions that could impact the entire mission. This interactive model demonstrates how aircraft lands on the carrier. These are sleeping quarters for the pilots. Here is a fun story. Did you know the USS Holland had her own ship's dock? A dock named Gunner was a beloved member of the crew. He served as a mascot and morale booster, often spotted alongside the sailor during their time of duty.
this is a forward auxiliary generator room. The diesel engine looks like very similar to the type used on submarines like USS Pompanito, another historic vessel docked in San Francisco. I have a separate video about this submarine on the channel. This engine was essential for providing backup power and keeping the ship operational. From the generator room, we're moving back to hangar deck. As usual, we're moving through the long corridors.
if you get to museum with kids you can spend the time with them here you can draw on the table with pencils and also you can uh, take a look at cartoons on TV Another set of sleeping quarters. Even the ship of this size space was always a premium. Everything had to be compact yet functional to accommodate the entire crew. This is one of the many workshops on board. Here the crew could perform maintenance and repair on everything from aircraft components to the ship's own systems. Here the galley, where the meals were prepared for the crew. The Galea team worked around the clock to ensure everyone on board was well fit. The enlisted mass was there the majority of the crew would eat. It wasn't just a place for food, it was a place to and win the and connect with fellow sailors.
This exhibit is dedicated to the shipbuilding. This exhibit showcases anti-submarine warfare capabilities of the USS Hornet. During the Cold War, detecting and neutralizing enemy submarines was a critical role for the carrier fleet. Welcome to the ready room 4, where the pilots would be briefed before each mission. In this room they would go over target data, flight's plan and any last minute updates before heading up to the flight deck. Here is something you don't see on many ships, a dedicated escalator to the flight deck. It was designed to allow pilots to quickly re reach their aircraft during high stakes operations, ensuring they could scramble into the skies as the fast as possible. We got to the flight deck. The guide is explaining the different color jackets worn by crew members. So they now use tractors, and they're responsible for the chocks and chains. So when we park an airplane, it'll stay where we put it. Unless I'm driving the ship and the possibility is random. Uh, green are maintainers. We have ship company maintainers maintaining the catapults and the resting gear. And then we have air wing maintainers who maintain the aircraft. And the, the organization they belong to is typically written on their helmet or on the back of their foot. Um, yellow are the, the plane directors, and the two important plane directors are the shooters, and the third important one is the aircraft handling officer. So we have three officers, and in the rest of the yellow shirts, there's probably four or five other yellow shirts that are enlisted. And what they do is they station themselves up and down the flight deck so they can direct the aircraft and they'll point and express an aircraft if it's coming from the stern to go to the catapult. So they hand them off so there's only probably control of aircraft. Red or Ortiz, they build weapons down in the magazine, bring them up to the flight deck, attach them to the aircraft, arm them, watch the aircraft go away. Sometimes though, the aircraft will get brought back with weapons 
and they'll strike them below if they need to. And, and, and building a weapon, fins, fuse, there's lots of stuff to do there. So they can reduce it. Ground church and plane cap. Uh, the Air Force and the Army call them crew chiefs, but because we have mostly single in, or single seat aircraft, they're plane captains. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a plane captain and an airplane. There's a many, many relationships between the, air, the pilots and the airplane. Even if you have your name on the county ramp, you're flying whatever airplane we tell you. And so plane captains do everything to make sure that plane is ready for the next mission. And we'll help the pilot get in here, help the pilot start, start the engine. We'll, we'll do whatever. And so and they've only been in the Navy for years. And they've got a $60 million or more dollar piece of equipment they're, they're keeping an eye on. And then white shirts are safety and uh, corpsmen. And the white shirts that are very well understood are the LSOs, the landing signal officers, who used to use these during World War II and are now using radios. But the landing signal officers, rather than wearing cranials, and cranials are the whole flight deck crew wears. It's bump protection, it's hearing protection, and it's eye protection. The LSOs wear sunglasses. Because they're too cool for school. This is a plane catapult on their fly deck. This powerful system could launch a fully loaded aircraft from the standstill to over 150 miles per hour in just a few seconds, ensuring a quick and safe takeoff from a relatively short fly deck. The process of connecting an aircraft to the catapult was precise and had to be executed perfectly every time. One mistake would send the plane to the sea. Here's a legendary F-14 Tomcat. This jet was uh, mainstay in the US Navy for decades, known for its twin engines, swing wing design and its staring growl in the movie Top Gun. That's it for today's tour of the USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so you don't miss the next video. See you next time.